What's the most fked up thing the US government has done? Sandy Creek Massacre? 500 Colorado cavalry were sent to track down natives that were attacking settlers, for good reason, but that is a long story. They ended up coming to a Chien village that was known to be peaceful. Its leader, Black Kettle, was a voice of peace for the natives and had even gone to Washington DC to meet with President Lincoln and negotiate a lasting peace between Americans and Chien. Lincoln gave him an American flag and told him that, so long as it flew in their camp, no American would harm them. Anyways, this asshole Chivington was leading the cavalry and saw it as some kind of noble duty. After months of searching for aggressive natives and coming up empty handed, the government ordered him to disband his force and go home. Chivington, now faced with the prospect of his crusade being an embarrassment, decided to attack Black Kettle's village, basically just to say he did something. The Colorado cavalry attacked in the middle of the night in mid-November, while everyone was sleeping. Eyewitness accounts are terrifying, and basically women, children, and men were run down as they tried desperately to flee across a frozen river. Black Kettle ran into the middle of the battle waving the American flag and screaming that they were friends of America, but the Americans turned on him, and he was forced to drop the flag and flee as well. The fact that Black Kettle survived is miraculous, but most of his clan did not, and the few that survived the battle mostly died of hypothermia and starvation from literally fleeing through a frozen river in the middle of the night. Cavalry men raped, live and dead women including children, and cut off mape and female genitals, and strapped them to their horses as decorations. Black Kettle and what remained of his clan ended up getting sent to a reservation, where they mostly starved to death, and Black Kettle gave up on peace as the younger generation flocked to warlords like Roman Nose and Crazy Horse. This ended up contributing to Red Cloud's war, as did most of the other atrocities in the West. Oh, also Chivington was known to have said, let's make lice, a statement that referred to his campaign of exterminating native children along with everyone else. Oh and I'm already sure Colorado nearly elected him governor after all of this anyways. The full quote was kill them all, big and small. Let's make lice. In case anyone was a Chivington sympathizer and wanted to say his words were taken out of context, they weren't. The full full quote is from the book Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, which is a non-fiction book by D. Brown, published in 1970, about Native Americans in the late 19th century. Without access to book, I can't confirm this for certain, but the omitted parts are likely not part of the quote. It's stuff like said Chivington or he added. The quote as it appears in that comment is taken directly from the Wikipedia article on Chivington. Interestingly, the 1970 book seems to be the first occurrence of the quote, meaning it's plausible that Chivington himself never actually said any version of it. Again, I don't have access to the book to check for myself. Brown may have cited a more primary source. Edit, credit and thanks to you slash doggy underscore lipstick who had a copy of the book handy. The damn any man who sympathizes with Indians. I have come to kill Indians, and believe it is right and honorable to use any means under God's heaven to kill Indians part was said in Congress, and there is record of it. Brown did not source the let's make lice part, which, without evidence, should be considered apocryphal. Even if the let's make lice part was said by Chivington, it was supposedly said two years before the other part of the quote. It isn't a full full quote at all, it's two different quotes smashed together out of order. This is why Wikipedia should not be considered a reliable source. Oh, and the omitted parts have a lot going on. The last ellipses skip over 4 pages, so to call it a full full quote is pretty misleading. The first ellipse is to just omit he said, from the book, but the source for that part of quote in the book is two non-sequential pages in the congressional record, so the first two fragments are likely not one single quote either. Edit edit. Further thanks to you slash FD, who actually dug up the congressional records. See here. 
it seems the first two fragments are part of a back and forth between Chivington and another party. There appear to be two separate government documents that contain the quote. Also, I visited Pine Ridge Lakota Sioux Reservation on a volunteer trip once, to help build homes and stuff. It was an incredible experience, but truly eye-opening and life-changing. I highly recommend going on a similar trip, if you ever find the chance. They have some of the worst poverty in America, and it is really sad, but a good reality check people need to have. To this day, it is just a tragic place. It is like even 150 years later, you can feel the depression and hopelessness and suffering of the generation so long ago. At one of our sites, I was chatting with the resident trying to cheer her up, and I said to her, your land is beautiful. We don't see this much grass or nature anywhere in New York. All we see back home is cement. I kid you not. She silently looked around the miles and miles of just empty grass, looked back at me, and said, it's my prison. And walked away. I have never felt so much frustration, sadness, self-hatred, and empathy all at once in my entire life before. But she was right. They can't leave. What are you gonna do? Walk 200 miles across the plains, until you can find the nearest city, to offer you a job. Nope. You stay there with your family, and try to survive, by selling trinkets to the passing tourists, who are descendants of your genocidas, but you smile, and sell to them, because it is the only way to make money, and because you don't want to ruin their happy family road trip to Mount Rushmore, where they can see the faces of the great American leaders staring eternally over the land that they conquered. It is super f***ed up. The silencing. Embarrassing and killing of Gary Webb. Gary Webb was an investigative journalist who proved that the CIA was selling massive amounts of drugs, particularly cocaine, to typically black, poor neighborhoods all over the US. This was in order to fund an overthrow of the Nicaraguan government by US friendly terrorists during the 90s. He was forced to resign, disgraced, blacklisted divorced, and found dead with two bullets through his head in 2004. It was ruled a suicide despite the facts he owned no guns, and it being two bullets through the head in a suicide. Okay, so they managed to hide a drug ring for ages, but can't kill a person correctly. Dump sizzle mayo. It's left just obvious enough to serve as a warning to any others who might want to expose such things. Exactly. People bring it up all the time just like everyone talks about how Epstein didn't kill himself. We know these things to be true, but we only know that there's some shadowy force that's guilty, but what the fuck can anybody do about it? Remember Michael Hastings? How he claimed the government was trying to kill him for his investigative work and they were trying to sabotage his car. Days later his car ends up mysteriously flying into a wall at 100 miles per hour. They know we know. That's the point. It doesn't even need to be a singular shadowy force. There's still probably a layer of abstraction just in case they get caught. The saboteurs slash assassins probably weren't acting on direct orders, they just knew that their bosses would be happy if certain people vanished. Kind of like how Putin's enemies tend to die on or around his birthday. The Tuskegee Syphilis Experiment. Came here to say exactly the 600 black males were told they were receiving free healthcare. Instead they were deliberately exposed to syphilis. So its natural progress could be studied. Some were selected. Because they already had it. None of them were informed they had it and none were treated for it, so they went back out into their communities and very likely spread it, none the wiser. The study lasted 40, 40, years. Edit, I misremembered, they were not intentionally infected for the study, they used already infected individuals, and told them they were receiving treatment for it, they were not. There's another answer with far more detail. So I actually took a class on this, and wanted to chime in, to refute some of this stuff, not because it's any less horrible, but because the reality is, to me, more horrible. The study involved 600 black men, 
about half of them with syphilis and half without, over the course of the study, some became sick and moved from the healthy group to the ill group. None of the men were deliberately exposed to syphilis. This info has probably been mixed up with another study, the Guatemala Syphilis Study, which was architected by John Cutler, who also participated in the Tuskegee Study, leading to the misconception. Also, the GSS was a horrible, massively messed up study and a dark, dark time in US Reasark. If you want to get extremely angry, check it out, and then if you want to feel like breaking things, read about Madrigal V. Quilligan. Man. My blood is actively boiling. What actually happened in the Tuskegee study was, that a number of men were selected in an area, that was known for high rates of syphilis, and were told by the US government, that they would receive treatment for their bad blood a euphemism for syphilis. They were coerced into the study through offerings of meager reward for participation, including a burial paid for by the government and a few hot meals. They did, actually, receive what they thought was treatment. They went into the doctor, they had tests done as well as invasive spinal taps, they were given creams and ointments, that has limited treatment helpfulness. However, as you can probably guess, none of these things were particularly effective, and some did nothing at all. In actuality, they were being studied for the progression of the disease, as the prevailing theory was that it affected black and white people differently. Spoiler, it didn't. This charade went on for 40 years. Over that time, penicillin, an effective treatment for syphilis, became widespread, but the doctors kept them from that treatment deliberately, even going so far as to bar the men from participating in armed forces, because the army would have given them access to penicillin and the better treatments of the day. In this time period the study was not technically a secret multiple scientific journal articles commenting on various findings were published publicly clearly the cdc didn't think they were doing anything wrong some doctors spoke out but it wasn't until peter buxton among others although he was the most effective a relatively new hire at the cdc blew the whistle from the inside that the entire thing stopped even then it took Buxton four years, 1968, 1972, to bring about the study's end, and he had to take the information to the press to actually halt it for real. The men themselves, for the most part, got very little by way of apology, they were given small amounts of money, and a formal apology by President Clinton. The whole thing is pretty well buried now, and is barely talked about in school, and in history classes. I think it's important that the full scope of the tragedy that was this period of US history is talked about. I think it's important that the real accurate facts are known. The event itself was so incredibly horrible, I think we owe it to those men to remember exactly what happened to them, exactly as it did. They were lied to and manipulated and used in the worst of ways, and they deserve their story to be told in full as loudly and as long as it can be.